Chelsea starts off this hour in Virginia. Hi, Chelsea. How are you? Hey, Dave. I'm good. How are you doing? Better than I deserve. What's up? Good, Dave. I was just calling to see, so I've had a whole life policy in place um, for about six years now. I'm sorry. I know you are. I know. I know you're against them. Um, so I, my question is, should I close it down? I do have term as well. Mm-hmm. Should I close it out and take the cash and put towards debt, or should I keep it open since I've already paid all my premiums? No, you close it and get out because it's not going anywhere good from here. Um, as soon as you've got the proper amount of term insurance in place, how much life insurance do you need? Um, my term is around $1.7 million. Okay. And what do you make a year? Um, me and my husband combined around three. No, no, no. What do you, the term on you is 1.7? Yes, the term on me is 1.7 okay. and I make around 200. Okay. All right. So you've got a little less than 10 times your income, but that'll probably take care of everybody if something happened to you in your case, because you've got an unusually high income. Wonderful for you. Okay. And, um, yeah, you've got enough term insurance in place and, uh, you know, if you don't need to do anything different then yes, I would not keep whole life life insurance. It's a bad place to park money. When you die, the cash value goes to them. They only send you the face value and you have paid for both. You paid for the cash. You paid extra to build up the cash value, a lot extra. And uh, mm-hmm. it, it grows at almost nothing, you know, one to 2% somewhere in there growth rate. And you know, you you overpaid for the life insurance. You got a bad savings program, and they bundled them together, and that's all this is. Yeah, and that's how I was sold on it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so uh, so yeah, you just you move on. You do your investing in good investments, never in life insurance, and you always buy the less expensive term life insurance. Hey, thanks for the call. So, folks, term insurance is about five dollars for the same amount you pay a hundred dollars a month for the whole life. So it's about one twentieth. So five dollars. The other ninety five dollars out of your hundred dollars going into a whole life policy a month is uh, going into this savings program. And if you notice the savings program on a traditional whole life policy, when you look at the policy, the first three years your cash value is zero. So you're paying an extra ninety five dollars a month for a savings account and for the first three years, they keep 100% of the money. That's called high fees. That's called you're getting screwed high fees. These aren't just inconvenient high fees. It's not the difference in a 4% student loan and a 6% student loan. No, this is they kept all the money you put into the investment for three years. This is stupid. And then once you do finally start building up some money, it accrues between 1.2 and 2%. And then once you do build up some money, after you got past the three years of nothing, the land of nod, and you got the land of not, and, and, and then you got finally a little bit of buildup, and it's making a whole 1%, and then you die, the $95 a month out of every $100 paid that you've been paying to build up savings goes not to your family, but to the insurance company. So you have a savings account for the first three years. They keep all your money. After that, they don't pay you much. And when you die, they keep your money. Who would use this bank? Most people in middle-class America, that's who. Because your life insurance salesman sold you this crap. It is the payday lender of the middle class. Most middle class and upper class people don't fall for the payday lender because they go, oh, no, that's a ripoff. But then they wander in and do whole life life insurance and lease their cars, which is just right there with payday lending mathematically. It's just a different tool to get at the middle class. And so, but walking around acting like you did something. I did it. I bought that crap. Sharon and I were straight out of college. And uh, some guy that she knew from a fraternity where she used to date some other guy, that should have been my, uh, should have been my hint right there. But, no, I let this goober into my house, and, of course, he's all preppy, and he's got his little button down going, and he's brand new in the insurance business. But he had the pitch down, and I bought it. I've got a degree in finance, and I bought this crap. That's how dumb I was. So if you did it, too, don't feel dumb. Just get out of it. 
get out of it as quick as you can. Everybody does stupid stuff. The trick is to not do the same stupid stuff twice. That's the trick. Because there's plenty of new stupid stuff to do without doing the same ones over. So just figure it out. I mean, you figure out buying a new car when you're a broke person. New car goes down in value like a rock. That was stupid. So don't buy more new cars until you're not a broke person anymore, until you've got a million-dollar net worth. Quit buying new cars over and over and over again and somehow rationalizing and justifying and telling mythology and legendary tales about uh, how used cars break down and they're not reliable. That one has always cracked me up because you know what a new car is after you've had it a year? It's a used car. Did it suddenly become unreliable after you've had it two years? No. So that's complete rationalization BS that we tell ourselves. And then we go buy the largest thing that most people buy that goes down in value, a car. Now, I like cars, but you have to stop and think about these things. Stuff like whole life life insurance and fleecing your car and financing a car and buying new cars. And, you know, just start looking around and going, I don't think I really want to do rent to own. Because I think by the time I've had that washer and dryer for six months, I could have bought three sets with what I gave those goobs. Just do the math on the thing, man. It's hundreds of percentile interest. And that's why rent owns and the poor end of town. Rich people don't fall for that stuff. That's how they got rich. Think about it. No lotto tickets hardly are sold in the rich end of town. That's, well, I don't need it. No, no, you, you don't miss the point. If rich people knew that the lotto worked, they would hire people to stand in line to buy the tickets. They know it doesn't work. They know you're more likely to be struck by lightning three times on the way to the market one mile from your home. Statistically, you have a higher probability of being hit by lightning three times while driving one mile to the market than you do buying the winning lotto ticket. Rich people can do math. That's one of the things that helped them. Oh, and by the way, most of them didn't start out rich. 79% of millionaires inherited zero. Start out like I did. Nothing. Nothing and stupid. And the less stupid I got, the more money I got. Why is this a formula? Because it's how life works. We have to work our way through these things together. And that's why you're listening. That's why I'm here to help you.